Hi, I'm Dr. Derek Lee. Welcome to perhaps the first episode of uh, BBT uh, Research Updates. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephanie DePaz, who is a spine surgery fellow at, let me get this right, Eiffel, Eiffel Clinic, St. Brigida. <laughs> That's a tongue breaker, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thanks for time. having me, Derek. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a spine fellow. Well, I'm I'm finished my last year of the German residency with Dr. Trobisch. I started to work with him in 2019. Before I was actually working in New Zealand for about three years, decided to come back to Germany. And um, I grew up close to the clinic. So I kind of by chance um, found myself in uh, Dr. Trobisch's team. And then I um, got my board certification and stayed on as a fellow. Just to get a little bit more background uh, from you, what was your primary interest in going into this particular field? What did you, what, what made it a bit more of your focus or your passion? Yeah, so um, my passion has always been more towards pediatric orthopedic surgery and deformity correction, not only limited to spine. So during my residency, I always tried to work in, uh, in children's hospitals, in the pediatric orthopedic clinics. And in the English speaking world, the pediatric orthopedic surgeons do the pediatric spine most of the time as well. In Germany, it's more the spine surgeons doing the pediatric spine. So when I came back from New Zealand, um, it was the perfect combination in the clinic now that I'm working with Dr. Trobisch, who is doing a lot of teenage girls or like, um, which are not really kids anymore, more adolescents. And with my background of pediatric orthopedics and than what I've seen so far in pediatric spine, it was just a perfect combination for me. Very good. Okay. Well, um, today we're going to focus a little bit more on, of course, research updates to, uh, I guess, tethering in general, uh, VBT, and maybe we'll go a little bit with um, uh, ASC as well for more mature spines, I guess. Um, so just this past April, uh, there was a conference International Meeting of Advanced Spine Techniques, I am asked, and they published some uh, interesting uh, research papers that I'd like to go through. Um, so the first one that kind of jumped out with me, for me, was the Sanders to, to skeletal maturity patients have the greatest rate and duration of post anterior tether scoliosis correction. Now, I always kind of suspected that, you know, the earlier you can get uh, tethering done, you know, especially large curves, um, the greater you can harness bone growth modulation, get the greatest corrections, but always there seems to be that fear of the overcorrection as well, because you don't know how much the child is going to grow. Uh, yeah. What's your perspective on, on this paper? Yeah, so it's a great paper. Um, so they have shown that um, the growth modulation actually works and it works the best there's the highest growth rate for senders to kids or adolescents. And that's kind of what we would expect, but that's as far as I know, the first paper that could actually prove this. So what they did, they followed up their senders to patients as well as a three and four, so they're a bit more mature group. And then they measured the disc height as well as the height of the vertebral bodies. And then they could show that with the senders two group, there was more growth and that they actually the the height of the vertebral bodies would grow more on the opposite side of the tether, of course, because we don't want it to grow it as much on the tether side so that they could prove this. So that's great because they could show and demonstrate that the growth modulation works and it works even better if you are still on a maturity level of a Sanders 2 patient and it works less if you were towards Sanders 4. Right. Do you think um, as a result, I know at the beginning of tethering, when the parameters was, were much larger, larger, they were already tethering, you know, in even Sanders one, two, because they didn't know the potential. Yeah. Do you, th with this, uh, papers like this, do you think surgeons will start considering younger Sanders two kids or is the risk of overcorrection too much still? So I think everybody, um... Nobody likes the overcorrection as, and nobody likes the failure of the implant as well. So we kind of have to find the middle way there. And um, one of the things in this paper was that it could show a high vari variability of the growth itself. So 
I'm not too sure if we should only look at standard scores and then make the decision towards tethering or against it. Um, so there has been another paper that actually showed that um, the mechanical complications are less if you're towards the standards four and more towards the standards two. So I think we still have to see what is the perfect patient and where do we have um, the less, lesser risk of um, mechanical complications over correction in failure of the implant. Right, so still waiting for more research on that. Yeah, sure. correct. But it's a great paper, a good start, and it proved that the growth modulation actually works really well. Okay. Now, uh, next paper I'd like to touch on is an award-winning paper, actually, for, for, the, um, for the IMAS conference. So the study is called the Harm Study Group Retrospective Comparison yeah. Study on uh, anterior vertebral body tethering versus posterior spinal fusion for primary thoracic curves. It was pretty interesting. And I guess there have been clues previous to this with other studies that uh, you know, selective thoracic fusion, uh, posterior fusion of the thoracic spine uh, does seem to offer better predictability, better correction of the curve. And even some studies I've seen shows that 30 plus years, the fear has always been degeneration of the lumbar spine beneath it. Correct. It seems Correct. to be pretty moderate. Uh, so what do you think of the study? So it's a multi-center study. Um, they basically had two groups, one which underwent the VBT, one which underwent the uh, more classic uh, fusion techniques. And they had a large number of patients included. That is great, as well as a large number of surgeons. So it gives a good kind of average what actually happens. Yeah. And, uh, um, and it gives a good answer to the question of, for, the, for the families, if they say, why should we consider VBT? And what are the risks that are involved with it, especially if you could choose between a selective thoracic fusion and a VBT, okay? So they were, I think that's what they're trying to answer the questions like, why would I even choose a VBT if I have the most predictable outcome with a, with, with a fusion, right? So they could show that there's a higher risk of uh, revision and more complications with the VBT. Um, and there's the, that the fusion is the more reliable way still how can you explain to a patient what, what, what can they expect from a thoracic VBT and what can they expect from a fusion? And I think your conclusion is the right one. So far, the fusion has the more predictable outcome as well as less revision rate, okay? Um, but then of course, there comes with the price of losing the mobility of the thoracic spine and the risk of the degeneration. So again, I guess, it uh, comes down to the, doing the best way you can as a surgeon to inform the patient as well as the family so they are actually able to come to the right choice for them. Well, with, uh, with your patients, um, if you are presented with a patient with a primary thoracic curve, right, and, um, uh, and you present both cases, pros and Correct. cons, how do you... How do you negotiate that with the patient? How do I make that choice, basically? Yeah, it's hard. I uh, tend to ask the patient, like, what do you want to do? And what is your expectation after the surgery? Um, so for um, our patients, they are really well informed by the time they come to see us. Um, so you have patients say, look, I know all this, but I really want to have uh, the dynamic correction. I do really want to have a VBT. That's it, right? And then you have those who kind of like, they don't know really, they go both ways. And then I tend to ask them, what do you, what do you like to do in your free time? Are you really sportive or are you not really sportive? Is that important for you? How is your, um, I always like to ask about the cosmetic point of view as well. So um, are you concerned about the rib pump or does it bother you? Does it not bother you? Um, Cause they need to know that the rib pump can better be corrected with the fusion and is less corrected with a VBT. So, if it's more a cosmetic thing for the, for the patient um, to have it reduced or not. So um, again, it's like, it really depends on the patient and their demands on their body. Okay. Well, sometimes I, I hear uh, some conversations about when you're trying to choose a two that um, if there's a thoracic fusion, select the fusion, um, that's kind of one and done. Yeah. 
generally speaking, right? Because yeah, that's the that's the goal. Yeah. Right. Now with VBT, there's uh, perhaps failure to tether, or right. um, the curve doesn't correct as as well. But but some people feel that when you tether, you still have options. You can always fuse at a later date, right? Yeah. But yeah. on the other hand, you want to kind of reduce your sur surgeries as well. Do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, you have patients where a fusion per se is, is a failure without even having tried the VBT before. Mm -hmm. So um, if you then tell them, even if they tell them, look, I think the best and the most predictable thing for you is the fusion, um, that's already a failure for them from the start. Um, so yeah, I guess it's all about talking to the patient and the families. Okay. Uh, the next uh, paper I was interested in was the multicenter comparative analysis of AVBT to PSF, the serious selective fusion in the treatment of length E5 curves. Can you talk about that and maybe also uh, explain what a length E5 curve is? Yeah, so the length E5 curve is a, is a lumbar curve. That's where it gets really interesting. So we talked about the thoracic curves and that, if you do, that you might not lose that much mobility if you actually fuse it, but most of the mobility comes from the lumbar spine. So that's actually what we are most interested in. So if there's a way, if VBT um, turns out to be a way to preserve the mobility of the lumbar spine, that's really what we want, right? So that's the multicenter study that you were talking about um, where they compared VBT patient who uh, for lumbar curves with uh, posterior spinal fusions, okay? It's a multi-center study again, that's great. Lots of surgeons provided their data. Mm -hmm. They had a two-year follow-up and they said clinical success for us is a curve that is stable under 35 degrees, okay? And then they again could show um, that there's a higher revision rate in VBTs, okay? but also that uh, there's less blood loss and that the recovery time for the VBTs is quicker than after the fusion. Okay, so it's, it's a great outcome, kind of what we would expect it to be. Yes. And it's, um, it's good that it's multi-sender, but it also means that there were a lot of uh, surgeons who might not have done VBT for lumbar curves that much. So I guess you would kind of have to see where this data will go in the future. So you can have to think about the learning curve of the center and um, from where to where did they do the, the VBT as well. Um, in, that, in that particular group, for example, as far as I know, um, none of the patients had a VBT below um, L3. Hmm. This is kind of what we, what Dr. Trubisch did in, in the first years as well. But nowadays we tend to go until L4, a lot of times and we feel like the outcome is better yes and i think the potential of the, of the vbt has the most potential in the lumbar spine where most of the movement is Absolutely. do you Completely find that agree. do you find that most of the patients with um, lumbar spine curves are very much more interested i assume they're much more interested in tethering than they are fusion right yeah they are there are, especially once we kind of explained the whole the whole principle of a VBT and you know, how much you can actually gain out of um, having a VBT. And I myself, as a surgeon in the clinics we do, um, if I have a patient where I know if the alternative is to fuse the lumbar lumbar spine, then I really try hard um, to make it work for a VBT as well. Maybe even harder than for the thoracic uh, fusion. Okay. Right. Well. This segues into our, uh, the final research paper we're gonna take a look at, which is uh, lumbar, which is from uh, Dr. Trobisch, uh, lumbar vertebral body tethering and analysis of one versus two cord constructs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so this is um, from uh, Dr. Brancini and Dr. Trobisch together. So, um, so in the last times we have started to use a double tether construct for specifically lumbar curves and in the lumbar, thoracolumbar region. So why did we do this? So we saw that the implant failure is mostly in the thoracolumbar region, and probably because most of, of the mobility is, is actually happening there in the spine. So then um, we went and thought, well, if one, if one cord ruptures, we should just put in two cords. <laughs> so maybe it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna be stable for longer, and we maybe, 
um, the success rate is going to go up. So now that's the first time that we're actually looking at our data. And we could see that actually the rupture rate is going down, although it's not um, statistically significant. That's maybe due, that, uh, due to the um, number. So we included, I think, 34 patients were included uh, who had lumbar um, spine VBT. So we, we hope that if we would have a higher number that we could actually even show a statistical um, significant um, difference. But the tendency is that um, the rupture rate goes down. Possibly what the, one of the, the kind of the tension, most of the tension is on the back cord, okay? So if that would rupture, the, the second cord is usually shorter and has more of a, it's more supportive. So we don't do as much tension on the, on the second cord. So if the, the, our thought process is, if the, the cord with the most tension ruptures, the kind of the second one can maybe hold it for a little bit longer until skeletal maturity is reached. So that's our thought process. But we still have to statistically show that this is actually working. Right, how, how um, what were the, um, was there data in terms of the length of time? Was it two years out, one year out in terms of the double cords? So in that, in that group now, the 34 patients, we had a one year follow up. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of too soon as well, because it seems it's that- It's too soon, that's correct. Typically, that's probably starting at two years out maybe, and a little yeah. bit more higher after yeah. that. That would be great. Five years would even be better, so. No. <laughs> keep posted. <laughs> for sure. Now, have you noticed any, uh, have you done any motion studies for the double tethers? To in, in we did, the, yeah. Okay. What did you guys find? Actually. So uh, we did, uh, together with the University Clinic of Aachen, which is the city next to us, uh, we did a, um, a cadaver study where we put in uh, one tether, two tethers, one tether and a hybrid um, construct as well. So we found that there's, um, the second tether does not really limit the range of motion further. So that's, that's great to know because our worry was of course that we're putting in a second cord, we would actually then limit the mobility of the spine again. So at least in the cadaver study, we could show that this is not the case. Okay, that's great. Doctor, thank you so much for your time. And no, it's been a pleasure. Uh, explaining